we're just gonna no, that's comfortable all right uh, have a conversation with uh like i said john ashcraft is going to be on here and uh you know we were talking this year into last year it's been on something on prophet isaac's heart for a while about just if there could be a way where we could bring in apostolic voices and prophetic voices and and, and the fivefold governmental voices into our house that could talk to us and help us process and lead us. One of those voices is pastor, prophet, apostle, all of the above, John Ashcraft. And so we get to hear from him tonight. He's going to be on, I don't know if you can, I'm just here. I'm talking into the camera. So he's going to be here and jump on. Uh, we didn't really plan on how he would be here. So Let's just close our eyes, say his name, and he'll pop up on the screen. <laughs> but we're going to get to talk to him while we're waiting. There he is. I don't know if you can if you can hear us or we can. You can you hear us? I got you. All I don't right. know if you can hear me. I got you. Hey, we're here in front of a live studio audience, and then we have uh, you know everybody at home is watching. But thank you for being with us tonight and taking out time from your schedule to join us. It's an honor. I'm not saying that just to say it's an honor that you join us, and we can't wait to hear what uh, the Lord's going to speak with us tonight, right? Absolutely. It's my honor to be here. Actually, I'm in front of a live studio audience of one. It's just me, so uh, hopefully all the tech holds up throughout this whole thing. Um, uh, thank you guys for having me on, um, Stephen and Sarah, Isaac and Zoe. You guys are, we just have connected a couple of times and in those conversations, God has really connected our hearts deeply. And uh, we know that we're going to walk together for a long time. You kind of know that there are relationships that are um, seasonal, and then there are relationships that are lifelong. And we really feel that about you guys. It's going to be a lifelong relationship with what you guys are doing. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no, we agree. We got How we got connected was we, um, through a season of frustration last spring, I just typed in the name Dr. Ron Cottle in Google. Um, and what came up was NBC Coalition and NBC College. I'm going to give you, hopefully you can talk about that here in a second. But that popped up. I didn't even know he had a, a new college that he had built and uh, started reading through it. And he had some videos on there about the ecclesia and the kingdom. And it was like he was speaking our heart that we talk about privately. He put it out there for everybody to hear. And I just called Isaac immediately and said I was frustrated this morning. And here's what I found. And... Um, he was like, well, let's just call and pull the trigger and let's get it done. And so called, talked to you, and had a great conversation. Lord, just kind of since then, we've talked several times. We've joined Embassy uh, Coalition and college, and it's been great. And so, Yeah, I've been, I've been thrilled with our partnership with you guys, with, with CAST and everything that's happening there. So it's been fun. Yes. So I'll just give my little introduction, then just tell us a little bit about you. You are the pastor at CT Church in Pasadena. From what I could find online, you're also, and I knew this, but you're also the dean of the college of Embassy College. Our, uh, we are a local branch of that, if you will. CAST is a branch of uh, Embassy College. And you also run the operations for uh, Embassy Coalition and then probably a thousand other things. Is that all correct? <laughs> uh, that's, that's pretty close. Uh, trying to find a time to take a nap in between all of that, but it's we're having a blast. Yeah, that's, that's it. So I'm on the southeast side of Houston, so there's more than one Pasadena. Usually everybody thinks you're talking about California, so we're in the one that's in Texas that nobody knows about, southeast Houston, and uh, been here seven years next month, moved from Arkansas, so just down the road from you guys, have some real good friends in Edmond, Oklahoma City, know a lot of folks up there, and so it's a really neat connection with you guys just to uh, be able to connect through all this. Awesome. Well, you know, we've talked a lot. Um, we've had several phone calls. Every time, I don't, I've never told you this, but every time I'm like walking around and pacing, like, I hope I don't make a fool of myself. And then we talk, <laughs> and it's like the Holy Spirit moved the entire time, and it's been a great conversation. And so we were talking, you had a conversation with me and Isaac, and, you know, we just want to hear what's on your heart. We've talked a lot, and here we've talked a lot about what the kingdom of God means lately what the ecclesia mm -hmm. means, and what it means to go beyond just normal Western Christianity and move into the expression of the kingdom that the Lord always intended for us to be. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, we want to be that. We want the Lord to not just, we don't want, we're Harvest Life. We don't want Harvest Life just to be a place where we have good meetings or good services. We want to mm -hmm. see the face of the Lord, encounter his presence, and then be the ecclesia that he's called us to be. And so I know I've talked a lot with you about your background and um, everything that 
uh, you know, all, all you've been through and all you've seen. And I don't know if you'd want to share just a little bit about, you know, where you've come from and kind of before we talk about kind of where you see the church today, kind of talk about that journey and how you got from where you were to, to where you are now. Yeah. So the beautiful thing that I see about the father is that absolutely nothing is ever wasted. And so all of the journey that has led to where we are today, including you guys, what you're doing with the church, all of it culminates as a part of a process. The father's not in a hurry. We're the ones in a hurry. We're the ones that think we're out of time and, and everything is going to got to happen right now. Uh, especially in the West, everything has got to happen yesterday, but I've had that sense of frustration for many years of my life, trying to see the power of Jesus transform, not just individual people's lives, but in, in affect a culture. And, um, I mean, kind of a short story of where I've come from in that whole process. I grew up in a, uh, w- with a set of parents that we were church hopping. I don't know why I still don't know to this day why we did that, but we went to a lot of smaller churches. Uh, we tended not to have relationships with people in the church. Uh, we would show up late, leave early. We went to a lot of, uh, Pentecostal churches. And that mean meant something different when I was growing up. Uh, that was a particular style of hair, um, and a particular style of clothing. And so, uh, we went to those type of churches. And so I saw uh, a lot of demonstrations of God's power, you know, I experienced a lot of demonstrations of God's power, but I was very religious. My whole framework of relating to God, honestly, was, I was just, I was a slave, you know, in my mindset, uh, I didn't feel like I belonged to it, to his family. He was God. He wasn't father. And, uh, that whole process began to change when, my now father-in-law showed up in Russellville, Arkansas, 1987. I, I didn't realize what had happened. God connected me to him. And, uh, in my heart, I realized he was my spiritual father, started following him. And over the course of just a long time being with him, he preached, he started a one month series on Matthew 16, the church. Um, and it was supposed to be a one month series. It ended up being two years long. Literally, everyone's Bible would fall open to Matthew 16. We didn't even need to know where we were going to turn that day. We would start Matthew 16, and Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell won't prevail. He talked about the church for two years. I'm like, how can you talk about the church for two years? Well, it got deep in my soul, um, and, and that was in uh, the early 90s, mid-90s. Part of what I did on my journey with him is, with him as my leader, my pastor, ultimately, I worked on staff with him, my boss. We went through everything. His heart was to reach our city. And um, he wanted to do something that was unique that would reach our city. Um, So he wanted to build a church that was not like any other church. It was not a normal church. That's what he he wanted. But honestly, we built a normal church because the, the things that he knew to do and the things that he loved and the things that all of us know to do and the things that all of us love often become the traditions of men and they get in the way of what God is actually trying to do through us. And so we went through this period, the season of where we soaked in the presence of God. We did the whole revival movement, Rodney Howard Brown, Brownsville revival. If any of you know anything about church history in the nineties and everything, we did that. We had weeks of services, uh, multi-hour services, two hours, three hours, just like forever. How much more time can you spend in church? Like all of it, you can spend all your time in church. The only time, this is interesting, the only time our church building ever filled up to capacity and overflowing, the only time we ever had people standing in in line waiting to get in was when we were doing those revivals. And the interesting thing was this, it wasn't the community of unbelievers, it was Christians wanting one more touch, one more service, one more soaking session, one more prophecy, once more to get slain in the spirit or to get drunk in the spirit or whatever, have an experience and an encounter, nothing wrong with those, but we just kind of got jaded. Honestly. Um, I didn't have a lot of those experiences. I know they're legitimate, but I didn't have a lot of those experiences during that. I'm like, what's this all for? Like nothing's changing in our city. Crime isn't reducing. People aren't getting saved. The churches aren't filling up on the weekend. It's just what we found was it was people that were Christians from other churches that came to join us in this revival. And so a father-in-law got frustrated. He wanted to reach the unchurched. He ended up uh, retiring early, handing the church to my brother-in-law. And we took a hard left 
um, or a hard right, whichever direction you want to call it. But we went in a completely different direction away from revival. We went seeker sensitive. And so we followed the Andy Stanley model, did a lot of that. The church grew exponentially. It was really fast. We were, we were reaching the unchurched of our city. We were seeing people who were atheist agnostics come and be a part of our services. And the problem was for me, wasn't that they were coming. The problem was that I began to be disturbed by, as I was like, we have people that are coming for a year and a half, two years at a time, and they're not moving. They're not moving in their faith. They're not making a decision for, for Jesus. They're not, they're not changing. In other words, they're not becoming a disciple, a follower of Jesus, that their lives are the same after Christ or after a confession as they were before, like what's happening. And so with all of that, I just had this agitation and that landed me here in Houston, Texas. There's, there's, I'm skipping a bunch, but that landed me here in Houston, Texas. And what I had in mind when I first got here was I want to merge those two ideas, the, the experience of the power of God and the a seeker sensitive type setting to where people that are unbelievers, non-believers will feel comfortable coming in. But I want to see the power of God move, and I also want to create disciples. So there's kind of this triad of things that I was trying to accomplish. Some good things happen, and then um, after all of that, we kind of stumbled on some other ideas about the kingdom of God, and, and things really began to unfold. But I'll stop there and see if I'm going in the right direction of what you're thinking about. No, yeah. I, what it seems like you encountered power with no growth. And then growth with no power once you get to seeker. I mean, that's how I would put it. And it seems like in both of those, at least in my perspective, both of those situations are very shallow to an extent. You know, and the, I mean, I love the power and the move of God for sure. But if my walk with the Lord is dependent on continually feeling something ecstatic, then that's yes. a very shallow walk with the Lord, you know? And then if on the other I hand... I would agree with that. If I'm... Yeah. If I'm only getting the, if I'm still drinking milk after 10 years and I haven't gotten any deeper than that when I should be eating meat, then that's still very shallow, you know? And yeah. at least what we've been talking about here is how, how can we, go, I mean, if we have to go, I'd rather go an inch deep, but a mile, no, an inch wide, but a mile deep with a small group of people, you know, with those who are really serious about the Lord, than go a mile wide, but an inch deep. And we look at, you know, we've talked a lot about this, but um, you know, Jesus continually did the wrong thing if you, uh, if he was following the Western pattern of Christianity, you know, he has 10,000 that he fed, 5,000 plus women and children that he fed. Uh, I mean, that would have been a great time to market the mess out of that and grow this thing huge and let's go take mm -hmm. over Rome. But he hides and he goes across the, the boat or the, the, he gets in his boat, goes across the the sea, they come and find him, and that's where you find in John 6, 6, he says, or John 6, uh, I think in verse 66, but he says, if you really want to be, you know, my followers, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. He goes so, mm -hmm. not, it's not weird to us, because we know what he was saying, but so deep that it drove everybody away, except for the 12 yeah. who are left, and he says, are you guys going to go as well? And Paul, or Peter's like, I mean, where else can we go, you know? <laughs> uh, we have such a deep connection with you, you've yeah. ruined anything else with us. And so we've been here going after how can we go as deep as we can in relationship with the Lord? Um, and, and how can that depth impact a region? Because um, we see, and I mean, you can, any metropolis anywhere, you can see a lot of the shallowness in any type of spectrum or any facet of Christianity, you can see the shallowness on every corner, you know, and that's not an indictment yeah. against anywhere. It's just saying we want to see how we can't bring heaven to earth in the deepest way possible um, to impact this region and then generations beyond that. So what you're saying is right on. I mean, it's encouraging to hear that we're, you know, yeah, one. We're right there. Yeah. It's interesting because, um, there, you know, there's a couple of things about what you said that ring, ring to me that I wouldn't move on from this in a minute, but I always find it amusing um, when people want to pick on the seeker sensitive movement, talking about it being shallow and with a lack of commitment. And I'm like, I see what you're saying. I, to I totally understand that. But at the same time, what I, what I experienced on that, I, I feel like it's two sides of the same coin an experiential based uh, following of Jesus. That is about what you, what you describe one more experience, one more, this, without it being transformative, it's just the opposite side of the other coin or of the same coin. 
Um, it's the same thing, just a completely different expression. And somehow, though, because we're Pentecostal or we have a charismatic expression of that, we let ourselves off the hook when we really haven't understood what Jesus was actually doing or what he wanted to see happen. And that is, number one, that our lives would actually be transformed. Being a disciple means we, we have a, our life is transforming. Our individual life is transforming. But then there's a call for us individually to form a collective called the church and to make that a movement that impacts the culture and the society around us. And, um, you know, you talked about Jesus having this, he had a public ministry, he had a private ministry. I had a friend that said something about four years ago, and it stunned me. Um, you know, I'm still in development process as well. You know, my, my mind has shifted rapidly in the last few years since 2018, my entire framework of how I see the church and what God is doing is completely changed. But my friend said, I don't use my disciples to grow my church. I use my church to grow my disciples. And you see this impact of, of Jesus feeding the 5,000. It's almost as though if you kind of step back, he did minister to them. He did see the kingdom into their lives. He did love them. He did have compassion on them, but he realized that the, the only way to really have an impact on their life was to develop his closest disciples, the 12 men and the 70 and the people that were close to him. And so in a lot of ways, those experiences to where Jesus was serving those people, he had the disciples do the work and he had the disciples developed and they asked him questions. So it was almost as though this project was growing his disciples. And I felt like Jesus said to me, or the Holy Spirit said to me at the beginning of the pandemic, it was where this had already shifted. And I was thinking really strongly in terms of what we were, our, our responsibility as an institutional body of believers was. I felt like the Holy Spirit said really strongly, I felt like that he said, you either raise up ecclesias or I will take the church from you. And to me, the significance of that statement, we'll get into what an ecclesia is and all of that, but the significance of that statement was exactly that same impetus, that everything that we're doing, our weekend services, because, because everybody shows up on the weekend. You have everybody that is fully committed to people that are investigating faith and people that have been in church for 40 years and still aren't committed. Everyone is there. And in the middle of that body of people, there is a group that are ready to move that are ready to embrace what God is saying, that are ready to lean in and say, I just need to know what my assignment is, and they're ready to move. And what I knew that he was asking me to do is to leverage the institutional body of believers and everything that we do as an organization to filter that down and find that group of people like he had his 12 or the 70 or whatever you want to say, to find that group of people that we can create a movement from. It's not going to be on the people that are there on Sunday. No, everybody's not going to move, but there are a group of people that are there on Sunday that will. And so it was very strong. And I realized that he was saying, if you're not going to do this, I'll remove you from your position. And we're seeing so much of this happen in the, in the church today. And I, I don't <laughs> be careful of what I say. I mean, I'm not passing judgment or anything or not trying to, but I just know what God said to me. And I'm like, Hmm, that's interesting. Beginning to see, the, the, of a sort, the crumbling of a model that builds a man's name and builds a brand. Um, and honestly has a lot of people make a decision to follow Jesus, which is great, but doesn't build a movement. And it's interesting how much of that is, is coming down anyway. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of my spiritual fathers from the moment I met him said, you can either build your own kingdom or you can build his kingdom. You know, his kingdom's gonna has been yeah. his kingdom has been being built since etern eternity past and for eternity future. Your kingdom's gonna die the moment you do, you know? And so that yes. impacted me to say, you know, what do I need to do with my life to build his kingdom? You know, whatever that means. And you've seen, you know, so many different sides of this, and I'm a very practical person. Um, I, I mean I wanna get into what you think the ecclesia is, but just as from a practical standpoint, how do we how do we build that depth within ourselves, you know, on a personal level, um, within our churches, while also, you know, we don't want to be shallow on either side of the coin, like you said. So where, what's the sweet spot? Where's the, I know you said you're on a journey, but from what you've learned so far, where's, where's that sweet spot where we're seeing the move of God 
come in an incredible way, but it's not moving only enough to, you know, tickle our appetites so we can come back the next week. But on the other side, we don't want to just be shallow on the other side. So where's that middle yeah. ground? I mean, have you found yeah. or I don't know if that question made sense, but. No, that's a terrific question, actually. Um, and I would say for for me and for us, that question is a continuing um, it's a continuing problem um, that we are, I say problem, I'm trying to remember something Andy Stanley said uh, one time, there are, there are problems to solve and tensions to manage. There it is. Couldn't remember the saying. So I feel like it's a tension. And honestly, I think for us, there's a seasonal ebb and flow to some of the things that we do. So as an institutional congregation, um, there are seasons that we do things that are super wide. They're, they're practical. They're not super deep or whatever. And our services may be structured toward that. We're looking to gather people and, and, and create friendships and minister to people. There are seasons that we're challenging our congregation to go super deep. And the messengers are very confrontational um, and all of that. So what we've, what we've done, we go back and forth. Um, I think on the one hand, we have to, <laughs> there's just so many things. I'll just throw a, just a few ideas out. There's one of the things I think that we make a mistake of doing is that we make a mistake of thinking that worship is singing. It includes singing, but it's not singing. Um, right. And so sometimes I think that we can get our preference for worship in the way of something that God may want to do in the service. And so like, you know, like I, I love long times with God. But I know that when we have a group of people coming in on, on the weekend, that particular experience may not work to just have two hours worth of worship, right? So that, there's that. The other thing I think is, is that um, sometimes we think when we talk a lot, it matters more, and it doesn't necessarily. Um, really being concise to the point, really driving an idea home, what Jesus did, he told stories and all that, he, he really connected with people. That being said, I think what we do is we ebb and flow. Right now, we just have a real deep pursuit of the presence of God in our services. And our services, we they're jammed against one another. We have an hour and 15 time slot for our service. It's been running an hour and a half to hour and 35. We only have 30-minute turnaround between the two services. And uh, so there's been some services to where we can't even get people out of the room before the next service starts. That's not always the case. That's where we are right now. But I would say practically and programmatically what we do is this, is we are always calling people to take next steps. We call it next steps because Jesus said, follow me. If you're going to follow him, you got to take a step. And so we are always putting in front of people, hey, what's your next step? What's your next step? And we have what we call an equip track that has, I think, eight. That may not be accurate. There are eight uh, steps on that, that connect track. All of those are programs that we've plugged in programs of study, different things that we're doing in order to help people grow deeper in their faith, walk with Jesus, take on responsibility and ownership and leadership of their personal life, the church life, understanding the kingdom, deploying to their assignment. All of that stuff is built in. Uh, healing, being set free from um, um, inner, inner healing, spiritual bondage, all that stuff. It's all built into what we're doing. We're always asking people to take a next step. So for us, we realize that we don't have to we don't have to accomplish everything on Sunday. In fact, for us, and this this is just me, and I'm not I don't want to like throw this, but for me, I feel like it's probably the least effective thing that we do is a Sunday gathering. And the reason I say that is because in those other environments, uh, like a life group, people are accountable in conversations and they're they're challenging one another to grow deeper. In a freedom weekend, people are are being set free. Uh, in our our growth academy, we call it the transformation academy. People are like practically living out the commands of Christ. They actually have to do. It's a laboratory, not a classroom. Uh, they're learning identity about the ecclesia. They're learning what the kingdom of God is, and they're engaged. They have an assignment to actually do the steps instead of coming in on Sunday. They may be convicted. They may raise their hand. They may come forward. They may cry a bunch of tears at the altar, and we may we may feel really good. It's like, man, what a powerful service today! And yet they don't take a step because there's no accountability built into that system. So anyway, I don't know if that answered the question or not. No, yeah, I mean, 
Well, first off, our Sunday morning services are our least attended by far because yeah. we don't have Sunday mornings. We do Saturday night. But, um, <laughs> I mean, what I'm hearing is just you're taking a, an intentional step towards discipleship on every level, you know. At least that's what yeah. I'm hearing when you say the next steps. It's like, you know, we can have people encounter the Lord in incredible ways on those hour and a half services, and that's great. But until people take ownership and have the avenues to do it of intentional growth and intentional discipleship, then they're just going to keep coming back week after week, needing another superhero yep. moment from the pastor to come down and save them. When it's, let's teach people how to grow and be who they're called to be on their own. You know, at least that's yes. how we see it. We want to see people grow up to maturity where they're taking care of their family, where they're the spiritual leaders of their own lives, of their own houses. I mean, they're the ones who, you know, put their foot down when an attack comes or whatever. You know, we want to see people grow up to be exactly who God called them to be and not just people who have to, uh, we, we, you know, we got to get the pastor on the phone. We got to get, I mean, we want to grow yes. maturity out of people, not grow church attenders, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. I'd love to hear, you know, we talked about the ecclesia. We talk here about the ecclesia. How do you define ecclesia? And then how do you see that role working in the church or the, the world today. I was very broad. So you can take it wherever you want and we'll follow. Okay. Okay. So that's probably my favorite concept is the ecclesia. That was my, my father-in-law seeded that word into my heart really deeply. And um, it really more was just the concept of the church. And it was a vague idea to me until 2018. We went to a meeting in Dallas, Texas, and uh, there was a couple of concepts there that got downloaded. And uh, the first was the difference in the gospel of salvation and the gospel of the kingdom. It's like, what are you talking about? And so um, that concept of the fact that Jesus is actually the church that I was raised in. Let me just go this route first. The church that I was raised in we were very interested in going to heaven. Um, our view was that the world was going to digress and get worse and worse. And, and if Jesus didn't hurry, not very many of us were going to make it. And we were very fearful. Um, we weren't, there weren't very many people that saw themselves as sons of a father. We were, we were tolerated, adopted stepchildren of God. You know, that was the, the view. And so we just thought that everything was, going to fall apart and we need to get out of here. And, and so when this idea landed, I'm like, huh, like everything began to shift. And I really began to pursue this understanding of the kingdom of God. And the word ecclesia honestly doesn't make sense unless you really understand that what, if we look in Genesis, God colonizes the earth with two human beings and says, I want you to take the divine government of heaven. I want to relate to you and through you. And then I've established my government on the earth through you. He said, let us make man in our image and let them have dominion. So he limited himself. He could, he didn't have to, but he chose to limit himself to our governance on the earth. This is the whole concept of a colony. We don't colonize anymore, but this is colonization. So he colonized earth with Adam and Eve. And he began to extend his influence. So if we look in Genesis before sin ever enters the world, we see that the picture was fill the whole earth. This is before the Hebrew people. This is before the nation of Israel, dispensationalism, whatever view you want to have. This is way before any of that existed. God's intent was to fill the whole earth with people that loved him. And Jesus, all the way over in the New Testament, tells us to pray a prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth just like it is in heaven. Well, he told the disciples also in another prayer, Hey, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his field. They pray the prayer. And the very next thing he says is like, hey, I'm sending you. In other words, pray for authorization because prayer is actually a legal activity. We make it a religious activity. But if you'll look in legal documents that go before our courts, you can cite, cite your case. This is, the, this is the case law that I'm citing. This is the, the judgment or whatever. And at the end of that legal uh, argument that you're making, there has to be what's called a prayer for the court to ask you pray the court that the that the court will find in favor and rule a judgment based on what you've presented in your case. And so we think prayer is this 
thing. We're feeling a certain thing. No, we're actually coming to the courts of heaven and we're negotiating and we're doing a governmental activity, not a religious one. And so Jesus says, in other words, ask for the authorization to be sent and then I'm sending you. So in the Lord's prayer, when he says, teach us how to pray, he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He actually has given us the responsibility to fulfill that prayer. He's not going to do it. It's not a magic button that when we, we push the button, we're like, oh, heaven just came because we prayed. No authorization was given to you and me because we prayed the courts of heaven to be able to be a, a governmental representative of the government and, and the, the, the nature of heaven here on the earth. And so when, when you understand that God is actually trying to manifest his kingdom, which to kind of pick that apart just a, a, a tiny bit, if you have a family, uh, uh, my wife and I were a family, we had four children, so we had, we had our family of six. Now our kids are married. They haven't given us grandkids yet. Uh, but when they do, we'll have a tribe. When those families, those all those grandchildren uh, begin to have all of their kids, that's essentially a beginning of a nation. And so a nation and a kingdom is just a family expression with a codified set of behaviors and customs and culture and laws of saying, this is how our family is going to behave. So when we talk about the kingdom of God, we're actually talking about the family culture systems, DNA being expressed in the earth. We want the way heaven, our father, how it is in heaven. We want it to be that way here. And so with that understanding that God is trying to get his kingdom onto the earth, rather than getting us into heaven, if he wanted us there, he should have already taken us. He actually wants us on the earth to extend his kingdom. Then the concept of ecclesia makes sense. And so he says, I'm going to build an ecclesia. Now, what Jesus did is that he, he borrowed terms from the culture around him because people understood what he was saying because he used ideas that they were familiar with. So when he said, if two or three of you agree is touching anything, or I'm sorry, he said, if there are two of you together, I'm there in your midst. Okay. So that concept was borrowed from the Roman government. If any two citizens came together to negotiate a legal matter and they were Roman citizens, it was considered that the authority of the emperor was in the midst of them. In other words, they had the ability, the right as Roman citizens to, to do government action on behalf of the kingdom, which they were citizens of. So when Jesus says that, he's saying, you've got the authority of the emperor. When you come together, I'm the king. You, could, you can negotiate and, and, and do legal matters. So that's, that's that understanding. When he says ecclesia, and I'll stop after this, when he says ecclesia, he's borrowing a term that is familiar to the Romans and the Greeks. So every culture and, and nation up until Greece went and raided every nation around them to try to find the best and the brightest people. And if you're a smart, a scientist or an artist or whatever, they're like, you're great, you're great, you're going to the capital with us. The rest of you peons, y'all are slaves, y'all do what we want you to do, y'all stay here. So they would import um, wisdom into their culture. Well, the Greeks said, no, 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 we've got the best culture. You need to know what we know. You need to do what we do. So what they would do instead is they would send, send a group of people into a conquered territory. It's called Hellenization is what, what this is called. A group of people that were leaders in business, leaders in art, leaders in all of the cultures of society, and they would send them into that uh, conquered territory. And their job was to make that territory, to assimilate that culture to where they started doing business, drawing, acting like the home country, so that when the emperor arrived, it looked just like the homeland. So when Rome conquered Greece, they kept that concept. And so that's where the concept of when in Rome, do like the Romans do, it means now you're a part of Rome, we're going to do like Rome does. So when the emperor arrives, he feels right at home. So here's the Lord's prayer. Let, let earth look like heaven. So when, when the king comes, he's going to feel like, hey, this is just like heaven. This, you guys have done this. You've made it look like that. So our job is to do So when Jesus said, I'm, I'm going to build my ecclesia, he's just borrowing that term. Guys, this is what we're going to do. We're going to invade, infiltrate, and we're going to influence everything and make it look like heaven. It's good, John. Isaac said it was good. I don't know if you heard him. He shot, he I did. You down, I did. Right? I got it. I got an amen. 
You had a lot of likes, I, you know. So we do, we're on Facebook. So thumbs ups are basically amens. <laughs> Loves are um, shouting amen. That's how I take it. If you, <laughs> so if you give a thumbs up, that means you know amen. If you give a heart, I feel like it's like an amen. So anyway, just future reference. Um, you know, I'm just trying. Everything you said, it's like stuff that a lot of us have been talking about. So I'm just trying to put together exactly what I'm trying to say. We, you know, we talk about ecclesia in this big sense, and I think, you know, you gave us this great definition of what the body of Christ is supposed to do. Um, would you say, and you talked about family and tribe, and so I'm going to uh, ask a question, and then I'm going to explain why I'm asking it, and then I'll just turn it over. But would you say that the foundational part of that is the family, that tribe that you were talking about, building your tribe, you know, your children, your grandchildren, and then us as a body of Christ becoming a collective of tribes becoming one body of Christ, extending that kingdom throughout the world. And, and I mean, we've really been focusing on family here for the last year and a half. Mm -hmm. And so um, here's why I ask, because, you know, we, it's almost like, you know, it's, we don't have time or the space to talk about, you know, eschatology or any of that right now, but it's almost like the mindset is that, you know, we're a, the, the body of Christ is this damsel in distress and the world is supposed to get worse and worse and worse until the Lord just has to come and save us because there's nothing else he can do because we're literally surrounded by hell. Uh, where, you know, the Bible says he's looking for a, a bride without spot or wrinkle. And in my mind, we're supposed to become more and more, not earn, you know, we're not earning it like and working on It's not through works, but we're supposed to become more and more beautiful and more and more spotless without wrinkle until, and this is just my perspective, that we're so attractive to him that he says, I can't be away from them any longer. I got to go. I have to go get my bride because she's, I can't be away from her. By Sarah, uh, I went on my first date with her on October 9th, 2017. Uh, four months later, February 9th, 2018, I proposed. And four months later, uh, June 9th, 2018, I got married. I, she was my bride, and I wasn't going to wait any longer than we had to for her to be my bride. Because to me, she was a bride without spot or wrinkle, and she was going to be, she's still no wrinkles, no spots, still beautiful. Uh, be most beautiful five-month pregnant person I've ever met in my life. But anyway, um, you know, I couldn't wait to be with her until I, I, to, for her to be my bride. And so my point is, you know, if our mindset can be hopeful and say our future isn't everything has to go to hell and then he has to rescue us from that, but everything is going to get, the kingdom of God is going to cover the earth as the water covers the sea. Um, and then the Lord is going to, we're going to re reunite with the Lord. And the way that the kingdom of the Lord or the, uh, the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth as the water covers the seas isn't just going to be through grand evangelism. It's going to be through families raising their sons, raising their daughters into the kingdom, and then grandchildren, and then great-grandchildren. And then 500 years from now, we have G, uh, you know, generations and generations of people who are living for the Lord going after him. And this, at least in my opinion, it goes to family units, but then even before that, it goes to us individually saying, I have one desire and one desire only, and that is to, I want to extend the kingdom of God. I want to see the ecclesia go, but I want to be so enamored with the presence of the Lord in my daily life, become so close with him that there's no way the kingdom of God isn't going everywhere with me mm -hmm. and spreading into every part of culture. You know, I've, I've shared yeah. this a lot here, but my favorite, other than Jesus, my favorite um, character, not character. My favorite person in the Bible is Mary of Bethany. Cause every time you see her, the first time you see her, she's sitting at the feet of Jesus, you know, um, receiving teaching while Martha's busy. The second time you see her, her brother Lazarus has died and she comes and falls at his feet and says, you know, if you just would have been here, my brother would be, you know, he'd be saved. And Jesus weeps after that. The third time you see Mary, it's right before, it's a week before the crucifixion. And she comes in, falls at his feet, and she washes his feet and cries. Every time Mary was in the presence of the Lord, she got to his feet and she stayed there. And that was the most important thing to her. And because of that, it transformed. I mean, her story is told forever. And so for me, it's like, if I can just get into his presence every day and that be key and then bring my family into that. And then we have, like you said, a unit, a family, a tribe mm -hmm. that is a kingdom tribe that is growing in yep. that. And then I have grandchildren. And 500 years from now, they're not going to remember Stephen Tidmore. I mean, I don't even know my great-great-grandfather's name. That's me. Some do, but I don't. Um, but they will know the name 
of the Lord. And hopefully they still will be seeing things in the glory of the Lord that I can't even imagine because it's just grown from generation to generation. So yeah. I said all that just to ask this. When you talk about the ecclesia, the big mission of the ecclesia, what do you think, would you say that the, the personal purpose, how we can see that happen personally, one of the things we can do is first raise our hearts to the Lord, but then raise our families and then our tribe into that glory, into that kingdom uh, mindset? <clears throat> yeah, that's a loaded question. So yes, uh, the, the answer is absolutely yes to that. Um, I want to augment it and say, just, this is my view. It doesn't have to be everybody else's view. Um, but part of what I, what I see when we talk about the gospel of salvation versus the gospel of kingdom, the gospel of salvation really comes from the mindset of what we were talking about, where the world is going to get worse. God is going to take us out of here. The gospel of the kingdom falls under the mindset that, there are two groups of people still that remain on the earth. And that is uh, Israel, whose, whose primary focus is the kingdom of God on earth. And the church, whose primary focus is the kingdom of God in heaven. And that's a big idea. Because with that comes the gospel of salvation. And the gospel of salvation then says, well, since we don't have anything to do, with what is happening here on the earth, our kingdom is not on the earth, it's in heaven, and we need to get to heaven. And really the gospel of salvation leaves us at this place. I need to give my heart to Jesus, and, and in being a disciple, I need to become a very good and moral person. Uh, I need my family to be good, moral people. And then that's what we're going to do. And then from here to heaven, there's just a gap because we don't have the kingdom here on the earth in that mindset. We're waiting to receive our kingdom that is in heaven. We're going to inherit the kingdom in heaven. That's the mindset. That's the gospel of salvation. And the problem is, is it leaves everything out that really Jesus inaugurated because Isaiah said that when he came, he would bring the government. The government will be on his shoulders. And then he said of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. In other words, if you could buy in a stock today that you knew was never going to go down, the day to buy that would be yesterday. And that's what Isaiah said. His kingdom is going to continue. I don't know what you guys are looking. His, his kingdom is going to continue to go up and up and up. And so the gospel of the kingdom connects salvation, morality, the kingdom of God, not in heaven, on earth, that God actually wants to do something through us in the earth in the time that we're here. Now, here is the thing. When Jesus loved the world, he didn't just love people, he loved the systems. Jesus didn't just save souls, he saved the systems. The government, the, the wrestling match that Jesus had with Satan in the wilderness was a governmental wrestling match because Satan says, I have the kingdoms, all you got to do is bow down and worship me. Jesus didn't dispute that, he just went the legal route of reobtaining the authority of the kingdom. And so what I think is this, I do think that we need to be people that are in the presence of God, that we need to pursue, be pursuing God. We need to have a relationship with him as father, which is a whole other, we can talk about family and father and all that, because I talk about that as well. But I think we have to be people that say, how did God make me? What has God put in me to express on the earth? That is not something that I'm going to wait to do until I get to heaven. That is something that I need to do here. And that expression then needs to be in every sphere of culture. There are different views on the seven mountains or the seven spheres or whatever. And I don't care if there are three or 35 or whatever. But what I believe is this, is that every single one of us, God is calling to place as an ecclesia, in other words, a cultural influencer in the place that he has established us to demonstrate the systems of heaven. So think about this. Why, why are people coming across the border into the United States? Let's take, let's take the politics out of it. Why are they coming here? Because they are looking for control over their circumstances and a better world. That's why you quit your job and move to another one. That's why you move to another city. That's why you move to another. Everyone is looking to better their world. 
And the best way the world can operate and run and the best blessing that can come is when the way that heaven is run is the way that we do things here. And so God has called musicians. And now, now let me say, he's not called musicians to go out and sing all Christian songs and all worship songs. He's called Christians to go out and sing what we call secular songs that are not dishonoring of others in the kingdom way of living, but they are songs that honor the righteousness and goodness that God has placed in the earth. We should celebrate like just love and family. And I mean, it's incredible. There's some of the country songs that I listen to, you know, there's a, it's amazing. And then the very next one is like hugely, like terribly immoral. Where are the leaders in that sphere that say, we're going to sing the songs that honor the kingdom. And we're not going to talk about Jesus. We're just going to talk about the things that the king gave us. So here's, here's what I say. If the kingdom ever shows up, <laughs> This, this is the thing that troubled me. I think it's Luke 16, 16. I got stuck on this. I couldn't get away from it. Until John, the law and prophets were proclaimed. Since John, the gospel of the kingdom is being preached. This is what Jesus said. Law and the prophets, John switches, from John it switches. And then the gospel of the kingdom is being preached. And everyone is forcing their way into it. No one is lining up at your church. No one is lining up at my church, forcing their way in. But if you and I can demonstrate the goodness of the Father, it'll be just like the southern border. People will force their way into what we have. And once they do, then we can say, let me introduce you to the king that rules the kingdom that I live in. You want to know why you're blessed? You want to know why you want to be around me? You want to know why you want to work for my company? You want to know why you want to produce my songs? Because I have a relationship with the king of this kingdom. Let me introduce you to him. And what we're trying to do with evangelism is opposite. What we're trying to do is we're saying, hey, you need to get saved to be a great, like give up everything that you love. That's fun. Like you consider it fun. We know it's destructive, but like we need you to come in here and be a part of our church and be sad with all of us and be afraid with all of us. It's not appealing. But when the kingdom shows up, everyone is looking for hope. They're looking for a future. They're looking for blessing. And if we can demonstrate that, not just in songs and in services where people are falling out on the power of God, but in actual real practical solutions in the world where everything is running like heaven runs, people will be like, I have to work for your company. I have to be a part of that. And through that, guess what? They will immigrate into the kingdom and be and discover the king. I think we're doing it backwards. We don't have a good model. And so people of the world are just like, well, man, that doesn't work. You guys are sad. You guys are broke. You guys don't have any money. You guys don't have. You, why do I want that? We've got to demonstrate the kingdom of heaven because God designed this place. And so if we follow his principles and his processes, we ought to be the most blessed people. I'll stop. Sorry. Please don't. Um, no, I, I mean, I think you said, I believe it was you that you've, you've asked the question before, if our church wasn't even here, would the city even notice? And uh, I thought about that. And I thought, if the church in America wasn't even here, would would our nation even realize? I mean, they might, they would realize it a little bit, but would it really make that much of an impact if the church as a whole wasn't in America? And there's some countries where if the church, the real church, was gone, it would definitely impact that nation. But in, in some of us places in the West, if the church that we know was gone, you know, what what impact would it really make? Um, yeah. On our, on our nation. So let me ask you this. If everything you just said about in, influence and culture and all of that, if, if pretend you're talking to somebody, not me, but somebody who's never heard that before, and they wanted to, uh, they, they, they've never, they thought their whole, their whole life was just to be to suffer through, wait till they die or he comes to get us and, and just hunker down. They don't know that they're supposed to influence culture. They don't know they're supposed to do that. That you know, everything you just said was brand new to them. What would you say to them? Like, okay, this is what you need to do first to start living that out on a personal level. Well, man, I'm just throwing softballs here. Yeah. So what I'll say is this: we take 18 months to address that. We have, we have a, a thing that we do here that we walk people through an 18 month course to honestly, to deconstruct and reconstruct a worldview. Uh, I have a really good friend um, that is a part of our congregation 
and we have a doctrine, you know, within our church that that we're constrained with some of the things that we can say about eschatology or whatever. Uh, and I have a friend who's really close to me, and and um, he said one day you'll never convince me, you'll never convince me that there's not a rapture and a seven year tribulation. I was like, okay, I don't need to convince you. But what I see is this: I see something play out in that that is like the song "Live Like You Were Dying." Um, that if we don't have a tomorrow, we just live for ourselves today. We spend everything. We don't think generationally. I mean, most of the church has no view of three generations from now. And God always has three generations in mind. He's a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's always thinking multi-generationally. And so a, sh a short answer to that is I would be like, I think, honestly, you need to just really consider Genesis 126 and to 128. You really need to process that and ask yourself, was that before sin? So if that's before sin, that God is saying this, then did Jesus do a reset? I mean, what, what was going on there? So in other words, are we back in the intent that God was revealing in the garden? Or are we still in this hopeless thing? Now, that, did Jesus actually destroy the work of the devil? Did he actually get the keys to the kingdom? Did he actually confer on us a kingdom? Did he actually give us the keys to the kingdom? Or those would be the questions that I would ask that I think if we're honest and start, if we're willing to ask the question that may be scary about our worldview and say, man, I don't know that I've got it right. And, and I, I'm, I'm that guy. I'm just willing to like, I'll, I'll throw it all away if I have to, because what I want to do is I want to fulfill what was in my father's heart. The other piece, and I know you said one thing, but the other piece that I think if we do foundational in this material that we go through is about the view of the father. If you can't see God as father, I don't think you'll ever get it. And when, when I say that, just think of your th yourself as a father. Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, things start unraveling the moment that you start saying he's not God. See, all right, I'll stop real quick. So in Genesis 1, if you'll go through, it says, and God said, let there be, and God said this, and God said that. We're, um, then in Genesis 2, it says the Lord God. So there's two separate words, Elohim, which means the all power. The Jews believed him. He was an all powerful creator. He's the distant God. And then Yahweh, which is when you see the word Lord in your Bible, Yahweh is the close personal God. And so in Genesis one, he's the all powerful creator. Genesis two, he begins to talk to Adam and Eve. He's Yahweh. He's the father. He's the Lord. He's the close God. The question Satan asked Eve that's been the Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord God. And Satan says, did Elohim say? The first thing Satan did was to create distance between Adam and Eve and the Father. And the moment that happened, that's where we've been living this whole time. And so our view of the end and our view of engagement has to do with the fact that we see him as God. He's ready to damn and destroy the world. He's just frustrated. He's ready to start over with another flood. He can't do that. He promised he wouldn't. He'll just burn it this time. And because we have that view, we can't move forward. But if we see him as father, we say, hang on a minute. He's the father of everything. He's the father of everyone. Like something doesn't make sense. And it begins to unravel. Yeah. Um, I'm just processing everything you're saying. Um, that I mean, that Abba revelation that you're talking about, it's been something that the Lord has been you know, bringing me through for the last four or five years, bringing I know Isaac through, and a lot of us through seeing him as not not this angry judge who's ready to send us to hell, looking for the re he already has the reasons. He's just just ready to do it. But this loving, merciful father who who just thinks about thinks about. It. I mean, being a, a father has changed my perspective on it a lot, but just loving us to a degree that we can understand is something that's revolutionized the way I live my life and how a lot of us have lived our lives. Yeah. Um, and so thank you, John, for talking with us tonight. Um,
I mean, I feel like we could talk for another three hours. I could listen to you talk. Um, I know we enjoyed it here. I know we enjoyed it online. We just really appreciate you. And I know, like I said, it was a Holy Spirit connection that God just brought together. And we got to meet you in Houston. And it was like the Lord just knitted our hearts together. Yeah. And so we're very thankful uh, for you joining us and just our relationship and all that you brought tonight. We appreciate you. Thank you. I love you guys a lot. Look forward to talking to you again soon. Yes, sir. Thank you.